Góðan dag og velkomum inn á málstofu Hafrannsjónarstofnunar. Þetta er fyrsti fyrirlestur núna á vormissiri til að nýta tekjafærð og hvet ykkur ef þið hafið við einhver erindi endilega að hafa samband. Í dag fáum við erindi frá Michelle Valiant. Hún er sem sagt doktorsnemi við líf og umhverfisvísta svið og leipjandi hennar er Guðbjörg Ásta sem er sviðstjóri hérna á Hafrófnustöð, Hafrófnustofnun en Michelle hefur sem sagt aðsettu við rannsóknarsettur Háskóli Íslands á Vestfjörðum og hefur unnið við rannsóknir og vistvæði hafs og vatna og sviði stjórnuna strandsvæða rannsóknarverkefninni doktorsnáminu snýr að því að skoða samhengi fars, atferlis og vistmótkunnar hjá umkviði Þorks, Ufsa og hjá göngu sem bleiki og urriða. Í dag ætlar hún hins vegar að tala um mastersverkefnis sem hún gerði líka fyrir vestan og fjallar um þéttleika ungviðis þorkstegunda og kóralþurungi á Íslandi. Það sé algjörs vel. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me today on my lunch lecture. Uh, so through the introduction, as you know, uh, this is based off of my master's thesis done in 2019. And additionally, we have collected more sampling uh, in uh, a few years after that. So the title is uh, Juvenile Gaudoid Abundance on Merrill Rotolith Beds in Iceland. So to start off, not a lot of people know what Merrill really is. And uh, so just to give a brief background about that, Merrill beds are calcified algae that grow as rough textured branch-like formations, and the term Merrill refers to various species based on how they calcify themselves. So Merrill beds are found from the water surface to 100 meters in depth, with the highest abundance uh, between 20 to 30 meters deep. Uh, here's just a very small video just to show you what that can look like underwater, because not a lot of people know um, what Merrill beds can really look like at that depth. Uh, they can grow for very long periods of time, and studies have stated that the regrowth rate is so slow that it can be considered as a non-renewable resource. It has been reported in northern Icelandic fjords that Merrill habitat is no noted as widely distributed and can consist of a wide diversity of epifauna and fauna species. It has then been documented that fish are utilizing the habitat as nursery grounds and particularly important commercial uh, juvenile gadoids. So as gadoids transition from their pelagic life stage, most depend on shallow near shore waters, near shore areas. There is no specific preference uh, pre-settlement but post-settlement stages, as they enter into the benthic areas, they prefer structurally complex habitats. So this transition of choice is usually for territory and gain of refuge, as well as predation protection. It has also been stated that nursery grounds are defined from high population densities of juveniles, where the growth rates and survival rates are high to provide a recruitment supply to the adulthood uh, populations. It has been reported that Merrill was found in areas such as Arnafjörður and Klamsfjörður, as well as, as, well as uh, Kralfjörður, where Merrill is located on exposed rock bases within these fjords. From 2011, there was geological surveying of Merrill thickness and distribution in Arnafjörður, Isafjörðurdjúp, and Jökulfjörður of Iceland, where there was a claim of about uh, 170 million uh, cubic meters of calcified algae in Isafjörður Dup and Jökulfjörður. Uh, the map illustration is from a published article from the Icelandic Museum of Natural History, uh, where Isafjörður became of interest for me to conduct my master's thesis in 2019. Uh, I'm now gonna go over a few examples of anthropogenic impact on coastal environments in the West Fjords. Uh, there are several, but just to give a couple examples. The first example is that there is an interest in uh, dead Merrill extraction. And so Merrill is considered a traditional harvesting in Europe as its skeleton is made of calcium carbonate, so chalk. 
and is used as a soil conditioner to treat acid contamination. In the 1970s, uh, France has used Merrill as an animal food additive where extraction reached about 600,000 tons of Merrill per year. And then in Brittany, other uses were for water purification, mineralization, and cosmetics. So there is a company, a lime algae company, that's currently conducting a dead mineral extraction in Arnafjordur, and they hope to expand into Isafjordur. And so this is uh, the map illustration here, highlighted in green, is areas where they're proposing uh, to do their extractions in Isafjordur. And uh, this is also then based off of uh, the geological surveys uh, that had been uh, conducted in uh, 2011. So the second example is that there is interest to expand fish farms in Isafjordur uh, from various companies, some close to where the Merrill Lime Com Company uh, projects hopes to expand for extraction. Uh, there are lots of past studies that looked at the effects of fish farm cages to the surrounding marine habitats. Uh, many of us are very aware of this through uh, the literature over time. An example of a study could be from uh, the Bay of Brest in Scotland, where there was up to a 100 meter radius of impact uh, to the surrounding marrow habitat due to an increase of debris and decrease in biodiversity. So overall, these two types of anthropogenic impacts to coastal environments can contribute to the cause of uh, mineral habitat fragmentation. So specifically for the presented study uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, I'm going to show you where the study locations were chosen uh, based off of articles that are coming out uh, that are about mineral distribution uh, within Isafjordur. Uh, so the areas here and here in the red boxes uh, are where the locations are are done. Uh, so in Hesfjordur and then in Isafjordur of Isafjordur Dune. So for the study objectives of the presented study, the first is to examine the role of marrow beds for juvenile gadoids at the time of benthic settlement. And then the second is to compare dive and camera surveys as a tool to estimate the juvenile gadoid use of marrow beds. So specifically, how the dive surveys of fish abundance and camera surveys conducted on marrow beds uh, to then compare with the adjacent uh, study or adjacent sandy gravel uh, habitats known as like the reference sites. The surveys then took place in 2019 uh, as well as in 2021 uh, from the onset of juvenile settlement to a into the, the benthic habitat and over the following weeks from between uh, July to the end of September. So this is just an illustration to show you uh, an example of what the dive surveys had looked like. So we followed scuba survey methodologies based from coral reef monitoring efforts and eel grass bed studies. Uh, this illustration is specifically from uh, the reference of real life survey uh, as this was the original photo. The transects lines were 50 meters long, uh, pace per placed perpendicular from shore, and the species of fish were counted within 10 meter intervals uh, over the transect line. And the overall dimensions then end up being uh, five meter by five meter and then uh, 10 meter intervals of the line. So from there, the surveys then started from the deeper end of the transect line and moved into the shallow end. So for camera survey methods, uh, I did use a GoPro footage during my surveys while I was scuba diving uh, to help with ground truthing of the substrate type as well as the use for any fish species that may have miss, been missed uh, identified. Uh, from there to compare the dive surveys with underwater video footage, I placed a stationary camera at the shallow end of the transect line to record uh, while I did the survey starting at the deeper end. The camera footage of the fish count was then compared to the fish count from the diver of the first transect interval. And this was done in Hesfjordur only of 2021 uh, for the three transect lines that were placed within that study area and uh, for five dives where the camera recordings were uh, then compared. So this is a map illustration of where each transect line was located, so between Hesfjordur and Isafjordur. 
The, the smaller figures represent the transect lines uh, with the 10 meter intervals by 5 meter of either side of the line. Uh, the estimated Merrill percent coverage per each interval is also shown here. That's uh, how the lines are highlighted in uh, different colorations here uh, to give off the estimation of coverage. And uh, as you can see here, there is three lines in Hesfjordr and then five lines uh, in Isafjordr with two reference sites. I then created a sediment classification scheme uh, based on past publications so that we could record the composition of different substrate types and uh, for the estimated Merrill percent coverage for each transect line interval. On the left are photo examples of what Merrill patches could look like during the dives. Uh, they're not to scale, but I just wanted to give you guys that visual of what it could look like uh, while I was diving in these areas. So the figure A is an example of Merrill percent coverage uh, along the transect line that could have uh, coarse sand and silts. B is an example of majority of Merrill with uh, some silts. And C is an example with little to no Merrill uh, against uh, cobble, boulder, and gravel. This is an overview of all the dive surveys where there was 48 dives that were done in total and extended throughout the summer season. Uh, a total of 238 individual juvenile gadoids were counted, uh, most often juvenile cod, but also safe. So it was 153 to 36 respectively. All the juvenile gadoids were most likely zero group individuals where they're about 40 to 100 millimeters in standard length. Other fish, fish species observed were the European place, rock gunnel, juvenile flatfish, and lastly, a large soul of uh, zero group juvenile herring uh, was observed uh, transversing the Merrill beds. So for the statistical analysis side of the surveys, there were two generalized linear mixed models used to estimate the effect of Merrill percent cover and environmental variables on first, the number of juvenile gadoids observed in each interval and second, the presence or absence of juvenile gadoids in each uh, interval as well. The predicted variables were either the juvenile number or presence of absence for each interval, and the fixed effects for the model were then the Merrill percent cover class, visibility, depth, sea state, tide, month, stated as a factor, and year. For the transect ID, this was considered a random effect to account for the potential spatial autocorrelation of the intervals within transect. And the juvenile counts were modeled with a negative binomial distribution where it was excluding the zero counts and presence and absence with a binomial uh, distribution. The model fit was then examined and confirmed to meet assumptions of residual normality using the package called uh, DHARMA. So this is the output of the GLLMM tests. First, showing the estimated effects of Merrill percent cover and other environmental variables on the number of juvenile gadoids, and two, the presence of or absence of juvenile gadoids for each transect interval. So there was significance at 60 to 80 percent Merrill percent cover, where it was more frequent uh, to see juvenile gadoids based on ab abundance and ab uh, ab sorry absence versus presence. There is no significance of other fixed factors of the depth, temperature, visibility, sea state, and tidal uh, and tide level. In 2021, there was a higher frequency of seeing juveniles, which is likely explained because of the camera surveys. And through August and September, they showed significance of seeing juveniles over time, uh, where I'll now go into explaining that a little bit more further. So the number of juveniles observed was highest in July, and this was explained by shoal size rather than by the frequency of observation. This is reflected in sightings of larger juvenile aggregations in July, followed by more frequent individual uh, sightings or smaller aggregations in late August and September. This pattern coincides uh, with behavioral changes from juvenile quad pelagic sh shoaling to defending territories, solitary behavior, and also dispersal from patchiness as the fish increase in size. 
The small, smaller juveniles were observed in Merrill Thalli and agree with Merrill acting as shelter and overall suggesting that the diverse and structural rugosity may be particularly important for habitat transitions of zero group uh, Atlantic cod. Merrill percent cover was the only factor significantly explaining the likelihood of observing the juvenile gadoids and the likelihood was highest in transect intervals with 60 to 80 percent Merrill cover. The reason for this is very unknown but it is all widely distributed in the study, whereas the intervals with 80 to 100 percent or 40 to 60 percent were rarer, and the statistical power behind those observations was therefore less. Looking at the raw data can suggest that the number of juveniles was generally higher on marrow beds than on coarse sand or gravel or coarse sand or silts, like at the reference sites. And even using a cross skull wallace rank sum test for juvenile number on Merrill transects versus reference, tra reference transects with no Merrill showed high significance. Uh, more juvenile guidoids on Merrill than on adjacent sites. Our results then support a higher frequency of zero group juveniles within uh, complex habitats. There were significantly more juveniles counted on the stationary underwater camera than by the scuba diver survey at the same site and time. In irrespective of visibility, more fish were observed by the underwater stationary camera than by the divers. The cameras were not baited as bait could attract large aggregations of fish and aggregation also of just larger fish in general. So camera counts were performed consecutive to the divers count uh, of the same area. Uh, I'm just going to show a brief video, so I'm just going to exit the presentation quickly. There you go. And uh, I just wanted to show you guys a video of uh, what the stationary camera could uh, look like. So the fish are quite small. But you might be able to pick some of them out. So uh, for these underwater, so there's, there's one right here actually, you can see them. <laughs> so I had to spend lots of hours uh, watching these uh, videos to really count the individuals and know who is who that was coming into view. There's one right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're very tiny. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, I just wanted to give you guys that perspective of, of knowing what it really looks like uh, underwater. And here's another one right here, actually, as well. As you can see, my eyes are very trained uh, to, <laughs> to pick them out. <laughs> yeah. Just seeing if there's any other ones I can point out to you. Yeah, so there's one right here. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna continue on with the presentation now. Uh, I know you just turned off the lights. I hope that's okay. <laughs> So previous studies suggest that juvenile densities post-settlement depend on the complexity of habitat. And I've been saying this throughout the presentation quite frequently so far. And uh, past studies found that a survivorship depends on the rugosity and complexity where the lowest densities were in sandy substrate. And this was by uh, Tupper and uh, Boatlier. For another past study from Laurel et al., uh, they found that within site temporal variation correlated with the abundance in sand, but not in eelgrass, suggesting that a few large aggregations uh, represent high abundance in sand and that eelgrass sites are consistent with individuals over time, even though less variable uh, at high abundances. Our current study is comparable to these numbers, uh, where we had densities between 0 0.16 to 2.56 juveniles at each 10 meter uh, interval intersect per dive. However, the estimate with the camera surveys was much higher than the scuba surveys with uh, one juvenile per observation on sand per gravel and 5.75 juvenile gradites per observation on marrow. 
Visibility was generally low during the study, uh, between two to five meters, and this could result in fewer observation as the fish could hide or swim out of view in response to the scuba diver's uh, presence. The surveys in Iceland can be affected by low visibility, factoring in with unpredictable weather and current activity where it is likely to result in lower number of observations. For this presented study, uh, as the divers pursued surveys, uh, it was observed that the juveniles would swim closely uh, to the bottom substrate and have moments of pausing next to the substratum until the diver moved closer. Uh, this is similar behavior as to uh, what other studies have looked at for cod juvenile behavior uh, for responses to potential danger. Therefore, the low visibility and juveniles' behavior uh, cause challenges at the fish uh, camouflage with the substrate or swim away from view. Merrill beds have a history of overexploitation and protected in areas along the Atlantic and Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the distribution in the North Atlantic is not adequately documented and there are a few studies on the associated uh, macrofauna overall. So for current knowledge on Merrill distribution and density in Iceland, uh, it's mostly based on proposed extraction sites, um, but there is also uh, other past studies uh, that have been conducted over time. There's no restrictions uh, protected from impacts, neither bottom contacting fishing gear nor direct extraction. And uh, habitats may therefore be at risk of degradation or fragmentation where predation may be higher and risking survivorship of juvenile fish. So in conclusion, Merrill beds are a habitat for the juvenile gadoids, uh, specifically at the time of benthic settlement. And beds with higher Merrill percent cover seem to be favored. Uh, this then supports previous studies suggesting that post-settlement juvenile gadoids have a preference of complex habitat. And for future studies, we encourage underwater video senses, uh, particularly stationed units over transect line intervals that can capture the video logs of these zero group. Uh, juveniles for their absence of presence and behavior without unnecessary aggregation or uh, disturbance. The study then highlights uh, the significance of conserving marrow beds for their functional role as nursery grounds for post-settlement life stage of juvenile, of juvenile gadoids. Uh, here are some acknowledgments uh, specifically to those uh, who helped a lot when I was doing the dive surveys, uh, especially for safety measures and uh, for the equipment. And thank you so much uh, for listening to my talk today. Uh, here's some information about myself who'd like to contact me uh, regarding questions about this or my PhD, uh, as well as uh, for the Research Center of the Westfjords, uh, University of Iceland, if you'd like to know more of what we're doing out there. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Are there any questions? I have one. Okay. <laughs> now, your last point. Uh, you showed us a figure uh, of proposed anthropogenic uh, disturbances in, in Isabella. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think we know enough about nursery habitats for cadoids or other species? to be able to just place them. Like it's, it looks like it's uh, based on some kind of information, but is it? Do we uh, have enough information? From my understanding, uh, I think that more is definitely, uh, more information to gather is always good, mm -hmm. uh, especially for updating uh, and knowing uh, what's going on. Uh, based off of past studies or uh, any information that we just continue to still not know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think that it's important to, to have more, yeah. Uh, these are calcified structures, right? Uh, calcified algae. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, sea pans in the Vestures have been using uh, uh, stuff to kill sea lice. Mm -hmm. is, is this going to be affected by this substance, uh, these uh, algae? 
To be honest, I'm not entirely sure for the sea lice specifically, because I wouldn't know. I, I don't know what the, the chemicals are like that they would be using. Um, but uh, just based off of past literature, there is a lot about just debris in general and fecal matter. Um, uh, and effects. fecal matter, are they going to affect the, the murder of bats, the beets? Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know what has been done no. here in Iceland specifically for that, but in other parts of the world in the North Atlantic, they have shown effects. Yeah. Nope. Thanks for a very good presentation. Uh, yeah, my name is Guðmundur Oskarsson. Uh, I was wondering, and I'm sure you showed us, what was the depth of the study area? And second question, mm -hmm. uh, were, were, it, were you studying, were, were the same depth at all the study areas? I'm, I'm just wondering if a depth is an important factor in, in determining if there is a cut there or if, if you should be looking at deeper stations or, or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, through this study particularly, it wasn't showing significance of, of depth um, for differences. Uh, looking at this further, I think that's always, I think that's always good, <laughs> of course, to continue or uh, to look deeper, for sure. Um, the depth that our transect lines were at, uh, they varied between uh, about eight meters to 20 meters deep. And I chose that also specifically as uh, I was the scuba diver and making sure that I wasn't going um, too far away from my limits. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Michelle, for a really interesting talk. Uh, I just have a question regarding the, regarding the kind of the comparisons between the still camera work mm -hmm. and the dive transect. Could you compare them directly, or was it more that you were comparing kind of the, the GoPros between the Sandy or like you showed, but you, could you compare, and, and how did you compare, you know, the dive transect with the, in regards to numbers while the others are stationary? And, and mm -hmm. I guess, you know, briefly, how do you do it? Do you count them for several minutes, or then you count them again, or, or is it a cumulative uh, numbers of, of, of June as you've seen, you know, for a, for a given time slot. I was just curious. I might also look it up in your, th in your thesis. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so these, uh, for the stationary cameras, this was only done in Hess Theater in 2021. So uh, there were five videos for the three transect lines that I did this comparison to. And it was only on the very last uh, transect interval that I did this comparison. So when I would do the dive surveys, uh, I would place the cameras at the shallow end of the transect line and then would, would go up, swim over to the deeper end where the, other tr the, the end of the transect line would be, dive down, do the survey, and then at that time that camera would be recording. And I would time it in such a way of taking a specific interval of the GoPro footage to then compare with uh, the uh, transect interval of only um, the first interval of uh, when I was diving, like what I counted at that point. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, almost. You know, okay. it's, it's, I think <laughs> it's always complicated when you're comparing, you know, something which is stationary, you know, but uh, as you describe that, you know, then you compare, you know, then you are doing the transect at the same time. And I guess, you know, you estimate, you know, how far you see with the GoPros and, mm -hmm. and all that, you know, but it's I'm always, you know, it's an interesting thing, you know, to just to leave the GoPros and let, let them come for, for some time, you know, and pick them up. And, and then again, you could deploy them at, at greater depth that, you know, you're not, would not limit, you know, to, to your dive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I, I guess again, you know, seeing the you know juvenile gato is is difficult, and, and then also you know going going down with the gear is also also quite quite tricky in many of those areas to cut them, you know, especially in deeper. Yeah. 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 Definitely. More questions? No. Yep. <laughs> Yes, it's on. 
but it's more of a common now. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to comment on, on it was really tricky to get the transect lines out with the depth, just to find like comparable habitats in all of these areas at the same depth, because mm -hmm. often, of course, in the fields, it, it's just very steep down. But I think definitely the, the site selections were as good as it gets in that uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> sense. But I'm actually interested in, uh, because discussing also uh, this with Kalle and I mean with you describing what you saw during the dives, uh, there seems to be a lot of sort of sediment movement and often the mold beds are just quite covered. Uh, so making the mold it, it, in itself much less visible. So how permanent are these? That's in your opinion. How permanent are they? Yeah, are they just like... <laughs> uh, I know they have to be quite old. We know that. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, permanent I as habitats, maybe that's more the precise. Yeah. Um, I, th it, I think that that's a main comparison of, of how thick the layering would end up being for the beds. Mm -hmm. Like how many of these marrows are just like leveling and lying on top of each other. Uh, for them to stay in these areas uh, for such long periods of time. Um, uh, I think that's really my only comment because I'm not entirely sure of, of how much the current would really take into account mm -hmm. of, of shifting them so much. Uh, but that could also be based off of uh, tile, tile yeah, I mean, levels, kind of etc. So the moving material so that it's fully covering the mural, mm -hmm. but it would survive and then it's just exposed again. Mm -hmm. just, okay. Yeah, I'll go for it. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, just a comment also. Okay. Regarding this, uh, the age of the, these deposits, uh, the, they have been measured in West Fjords, mm -hmm. and they're up to 10 meters thick, and their, uh, their uh, accumulation is thought about, about one millimeter per year, mm -hmm. which means that these deposits started f being formed just after the ice age, 10,000 years ago. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think uh, you get, get often sediment on the mole, mm -hmm. but there is very uh, much bi 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 biological activity inside the matrix, mm -hmm. where you have animals going in and out of the matrix, turning, off, turning around these nodules, and the sediment goes down in between them. Yeah. So you get sediment. Uh, accumulating under the life world, which is only about maybe 5 to, to 10, 15 centimeters thick. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there, that's the, the, the sediment underneath, which is okay. just li like a like, uh, very soft sediment, or, or mixed with, with uh, merl uh, fragments. Mm -hmm. And that's what they are actually extracting. But uh, again, these can be uh, exposed to, to uh, uh, lethal uh, sedimentation, which we observed now in, in Eyjafjörður, mm -hmm. where we had a, 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 a inflow of sand in the, in the shallow sublateral zone, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we had a, a live merl bed un, underneath. Yeah. But when we came again now, this, this sand was, had disappeared from from the shallow sublateral zone, and was uh, there was a cover cover of sand over the mole bed. Mm -hmm. So we started uh, uh, taking the sand away and, and found that uh, whole nodules, not, not fragments, just whole nodules of, of mole that underneath the sand. So it's vulnerable to to, to too much sedimentation. Mm -hmm. But I think in, in, in a normal situation they can cope with some uh, limited sedimentation mm -hmm. by, by these biogenic uh, or, or organisms that are, are moving them around, yeah, getting in and out of the, the, the mold. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I think they can all hear me. Yeah, okay, online, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is interesting because it's key to their function as, as a habitat. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. to, the, to, to the larger. Well, to the fish and other larger species there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just knowing that there is a high amount of biodiversity of various types of species there. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting, Kali. Uh, any more questions? 
if not, then thank you very much, Michelle. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>